So turning now to a new development with the conspiracy group QAnon. A quick refresher, it is the group founded on the belief that Donald Trump would secretly take down a fictitious group of satanic, child-eating cannibals that ran our government. It seems the group, uh, the group seems to have a new plan to gain influence. Senior reporter for NBC News, Ben Collins, joins us now with that new reporting that in the wake of Donald Trump's 2020 election defeat and the disappearance of the anonymous online account Q that once served as QAnon's inspiration, many people who spout QAnon's false claims have hatched a new plan. Run for school board or local office, spread the gospel of Q, but don't call it QAnon. Thank you so much for being with us, Ben. Uh, before we get to this uh, wow. uh, really interesting uh, plan and strategy uh, by supporters of QAnon, uh, just just curious, can you give us a background? We, uh, we heard the news that Marjorie Taylor Greene is now telling people uh, that, that believe the QAnon uh, conspiracy theory that Donald Trump is going to be president, uh, reinstated as president in August. Uh, is out now telling people that is not true, it's not going to happen. I'm, I'm curious, in general, how much uh, is the, the, the QAnon uh, movement uh, in retreat right now? Uh, they're in retreat in, to the extent that they don't want anything to do with the name QAnon, but they will continue kicking mm -hmm. the can down the road uh, about the president, about Donald Trump being, <clears throat> excuse me, reinstated as president. That's in part because of how it works. It's how cult-like cult movements work like this. They work on disconfirmation. They work on continually having a doomsday that's coming somewhere down the line. So look, they, they hate the branding QAnon, but all the tenets in the mythology of QAnon have stayed in these network factions they've built up over the years, You know, these, these uh, forums and influencers that they always look to for new guidance. They are shifting right. the plan down the road. They're saying it's coming later on. But uh, the actual movement itself is not going away. So can, can, can you explain to us, and I, I, I've, I've, I've read some of your explanations before, but just explain to people who are watching, who are curious like me, um, uh, how is it that all of these scenarios are set forth, something's going to happen on February such and such, something's going to happen in March, something, and they never happen. And you move past that date, and you would think most people would be humiliated for going on social media and telling the world that an event was going to happen on a date certain. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So then they move it forward a month. It doesn't happen on that date. They move it forward two months. It doesn't happen on that date. Obviously, Donald Trump's not going to be reinstated in August. What Psychologically, what, what is it? I know you've talked to, to a, a good number of members. What is it that keeps them moving forward even after they've been proven wrong and been proven gullible time and time again? If you talk to cult psychology experts about this, uh, you know, back in the 60s, there was a cult that had a hard doomsday, right? That they were all going to be taken up into, uh, into space and everything was going to be fine while Earth got destroyed. That doomsday came and went, but people afterwards got more and more into the belief set that they had done something to push that date back, that they think, you know, hey, we must have been doing, we must have been fighting the right war that whole time if we didn't uh, wind up getting raptured here, and that's what QAnon people believe. They believe that they are fighting a long war with the United States government on the internet through digital soldiers, is what Michael Flynn calls them. So they, they believe they've done something right if you know these doomsdays haven't come yet, and it keeps getting pushed down the road. And it's, there's also an element of just human nature here, right? If you've gone all in on something deeply embarrassing, which is what QAnon is, and it doesn't happen over and over again. There's really two options, right? It's either, you know, you know, with your tail tucked between your legs, run back to your family and be like, I guess, I guess I wasn't right. Or you can just double and triple down and say, no, I'm right all along. It's all going to come out soon, which is what QAnon believers tend to do. All right, so tell us about the plan of, of QAnon believers to start running for local offices like school board. Yeah, so uh, look, as Q went away, so Q is this you know, omniscient insider in their mythology in the government, um, I think most, even QAnon believers think, look, that guy's not coming back. He hasn't posted since December 8th, so we're over six, seven months of that now. Um, so they've looked for different strategies. They still have these forums, they still have these influencers who are trying to decode old Q posts, trying to decode what President Trump is still saying, 
um, you know, from Mar-a-Lago or wherever he is. So instead of abandoning that, they have looked to people like Michael Flynn. And Michael Flynn has said, run for school board, run for local office. He said, get involved in the education of our children. And they've taken that quote and they've affixed it to the top of their forms. They've said, you know, this is our next plan. This is the real plan. You know, we need to, instead of just waiting around for stuff to happen, we need to take it, take the bull by the horns, basically. And in some cases, it's working. These are elections where, you know, 100 something votes can win. Um, and they are winning at, you know, you know, local offices all throughout the country, California, Pennsylvania, Florida, Michigan. They are telling people to run and they are doing it. Ben, it's Casey Hunt. Um, what is the overlap between uh, the QAnon people or the you know next evolution of QAnon and some of these extremist white supremacist groups, the three percenters, the Proud Boys that we saw at the Capitol riot? Because I mean, I remember seeing Mike Flynn signs, but also we're learning about kind of the tactical planning. It is what is the connection between them, if any? Sure, there was a moment with both the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers where they decided a couple of years ago that, you know, the bigger the tent, the better. We'll let in really anybody who's committed to the mission of making Donald Trump uh, the front and center of, you know, of their lives, basically, uh, driving that culture war. So QAnon people kind of came in a couple of years ago and said, you know, we'll be a part of this. It's, it's the real life militant version of what we've been fighting for anyway. And that's what you saw in January 6th is, you know, Q people next to Proud Boys or you know, and you've seen Proud Boys wearing Q patches in the past, Oath Keepers doing the same thing. Um, even though sometimes these militia groups look down on QAnon people, they, they think they're just as pathetic as I would say most people do, but they will allow them in because it's numbers, it's just sheer force, and they have a lot of ideological agreements uh, about culture war issues. So that's where you see it. You know, after the six, the, these, these groups started recruiting in those Q spaces, realizing that, you know, these people might want to take their fight more public. Um, and that's what's happened. As Q, QAnon has dissolved a little bit, uh, the Q followers have found more actionable spaces to take out their grievances. Uh, Mike Barnacle's with us and has a question. Mike. So, Ben, uh, the other day I came out of the supermarket on Nantucket Island and I found that I was parked next to a car that had a QAnon bumper sticker on it. Now, I'm certain that there are not people walking around on Nantucket Island wearing Q t-shirts. So in terms of the strength of the group, how much of the group now, and because of the way Q is going, the direction that Q is going in, how much of the group is basically more interested in culture ideas like race, what's taught in school, critical race theory, things like that? How much of the group is composed of that philosophy? First of all, Mike, you're right. This isn't a blue state, red state thing. Um, you see this all throughout the country. And you see it, you know, QAnon has invaded yoga groups on Facebook and in real life. Um, it, any, anywhere there's sort of fringe ideology, and yoga is not one of those things, but anywhere you can get like maybe alternative medicine, um, they, they will find a way in. So it's not a strict, you know, it, it doesn't go by ideological borders at all. So um, that, that's one thing. But, you know, with the critical race theory stuff, uh, it's opened up a new public platform um, in, in school board meetings to make YouTube videos, to go up there and, and to get the crowd riled up. Our story is, you know, foundationally, uh, there's a guy in Florida who went up there and talked about, you know, the, the Hollywood pedophiles that are carrying away our children at these school board meetings. And a lot of people are at the school board meeting to talk about critical race theory. It just adds to a laundry list of grievances and complaints that people have with school boards, whether it be about mask mandates, critical race theory, or now just you know general generalized QAnon stuff, they can talk about any of that stuff, any of any of the you know conservative culture war stuff. There's a podium for that at your local school board, and it'll get uploaded to YouTube afterwards. You can share it on your own Instagram page. That's where we're seeing this overlap. All right, NBC's Ben Collins. Thank you so much Thanks, for ben. your reporting. We greatly appreciate it as always.